So this is one of those things that your lab manual does cover or does attempt to cover. Um, and it, it is a topic that is addressed in your book. But I do remember uh, from years, well, two or three years ago, doing this standing waves in sound the lab, that this is the one of the things that people get hung up on. And I think, uh, I believe, it's uh, from people starting to break out of their habit on just looking up formulas and using them. Because um, with the standing waves, um, if you are simply trying to look up the formulas for uh, you know, what frequencies are what harmonics or what wavelengths are what harmonics. There are so many ways you can go wrong. Like even the first of the pictures you see in the lab manual, this doesn't actually address the picture that relate, that, that is actually um, something that corresponds to your lab setup. This is illustrating something that uh, maybe a more visually familiar setup that people might have seen. But your actual lab setup works with something um, that your textbook would describe as a half open pipe. Um, so, you know, one end is closed and the other end is open. And um, these modify the situation enough that um, if you are trying to use the formulas that you had uh, with this setup, then it simply will fail to work for this setup. And um, as I said, this is something covered in your textbook. That's what this is getting to, section 17.4. When you go to that section and look at the formulas for uh, standing sound wave, then uh, it'll give you some formulas under a few different conditions. So there's a uh, resonance in a tube closed at one end. So if you want an example to just follow step by step and have some reasonable assurance that it will match up perfectly to your lab, then this is it. Uh, your lab will deal with a tube, sound waves in a tube closed at one end. So uh, all the things that they're describing here, including this kind of picture of the um, picture of the standing waves, uh, all this will match. Um, yeah, and this no displacement, the maximum displacement, it'll all match as well. Just with a bit of a caveat, um, so I tend to, I, I prefer the pressure representation. So uh, most of the level use the pressure representation, but in terms of the deriving formulas and whatnot, you can use either the displacement representation or the pressure representation. Both of them works fine. So, so this is something that you can follow and, um, and you know, get uh, have a reasonable assurance that this exactly matches to your lab setup. And these formulas that they will drive, it'll work fine. But I think uh, the place where I want people to be either at the end of this class or in uh, near future in your next class, either physics or engineering, um, is where you feel enough drawing these pictures, you feel comfortable enough drawing these pictures yourself and basically driving this formula yourself because this is one of these things where if you draw these pictures and kind of start to see the pattern that emerges out of here, you can guess at this formula. You don't need someone else to tell you, oh, this is the formula for a resonant wavelength in a tube closed at one end, and you have one entirely different formula for a tube that's open at both ends. Like, you don't need that. So, um, but, you know, if you just want the answer, here's the answer. <laughs> um, now, yeah, resonance in a tube at open at both ends. So this is the setup that will lead to answer formulas <laughs> that are more similar to what you would have guessed if you looked at a picture like this. And uh, the difference between the situation that you have here versus the situation that you have here, it comes down to a matter of a difference of boundary condition. So, um, and uh, the lab manual does try to talk about boundary conditions and um, and uh, I did my best to trying to explain this in this written form, but I, I do get a lot of questions each semester. So I think it's uh, one of those things that it takes people some uh, getting used to, some 
uh, kind of thinking through it some amount of time. Uh, if you are, if so, for those of you who might be a little bit ahead in the math sequence that goes with your physics sequence, um, boundary conditions uh, are sometimes called initial conditions in in the context of differential equation solving. Um, I guess you know it's conditions at the boundary, or it's conditions initial uh, at time equals zero. Um, so it, yeah, conditions at the edge. Um, so what I want you to show you in the next five to 10 minutes or so is uh, basically an expansion on uh, a lecture video that is actually kind of on, um, uh, that is linked from the lecture modules. Let me just uh, point you to what I'm trying to reproduce here. So uh, when you look at, I think it was chapter 16, I did uh, um, link one of the, videos that I made way back for a conceptual physics class. And uh, when you watch through this video, it does uh, kind of show you all these different kinds of uh, standing waves that show up. And towards the end, it kind of talks a little bit about that. So there's a five minute or so of me showing how um, the conditions for standing waves become different when you change the conditions at the boundary. And I just want you to expand on that a little bit because this was made for a conceptual physics class. I didn't really get to uh, go into more quantitative details. And I think it'll be useful to just um, show a little bit of that. Also, back when I made this video, the screen sharing software I was using it was super laggy. So, <laughs> so uh, let me just bring up the simulation and show you with the simulation how what kind of difference the difference of boundary condition makes waves on a string. Uh, I think I say in one of the lectures, this is one of my favorite simulations. It's so useful for illustrating a bunch of different things. Um, and you can kind of do an arbitrary thing and uh, you can do something that's more controllable, like with a pulse. Um, you can do something that's gonna relate better to standing waves. Um, and you, so the default setting is a fairly realistic, like this picture is something you can expect to see if you have a string, literal string that's tied down at one end and you're just shaking the other end. Something like this is something that you might expect to see. Now, a downside of this is that it's the downside of the real world that it includes all the complications that, um, that we, like to idealize away in these intro classes. The biggest of which is the damping. That's uh, the damping is what's responsible for making this wave smaller at this end. So uh, simulation, I could get rid of damping. Now, once you do that, um, I guess here maybe it doesn't look all that unusual, but uh, sometimes it will introduce like, uh, I don't know, like this weird kink and whatnot. Um, you know, you kind of have to learn to ignore some of those um, simulation artifacts <laughs> that has to do with unrealistic simulation like this. And finally, I can do slow motion so that mainly so that I get more time to talk. So this is the simulation. And um, if you want to set up a standing wave, just like you will see when you are setting up standing wave in the lab, you are going to see that you have to pay um, close attention to some things. So I, just to change this to no end so that the uh, waves that were basically reflecting back and forth here is allowed to just escape to one end and not bother me anymore. So everything here can be just basically described as um, traveling waves, um, traveling periodic waves uh, that's going from left to right. And so let's see. Um, uh, how do I, uh, let me just restart. <laughs> so if I want to set up a standing wave, uh, first I need to know resonant frequencies. So let me um, repeat something that I've done in the lecture, which is have a fixed end here and set up a standing wave in this setup. So uh, I need a timer so that I can learn what frequencies at which this might resonate at. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna start the timer. Now you will see that it hasn't changed because this is a simulation clock timer. So this 
time won't start to run until I start the simulation. I think I can leave the amplitude here. Yeah, so I'm gonna start the simulation, okay. Just to watching this end and I'm gonna stop it and go frame by frame until this red bead starts to move. Okay, okay there. So 1.18 second. So that's uh, some kind of special time. It's the amount of time it takes uh, for a disturbance at one, one end to travel all the way to the other end, 1.18 second. So let me find the frequency that matches to that 1.18 second of time. So the frequency would be one, the reciprocal, one divided by 1.18. So frequency of 0 0.847 or 0 0.85. It's somehow going to be a special frequency. So let's uh, try setting this here, reset, and see what happens. Uh, let me do normal speed so that it doesn't take as long. Yeah. So you start to see something building up here. And um, let me make a small change to make this illustration a little bit more um, more striking. So right now, when you, as you see this large oscillation, um, you might say, oh, on the left hand, I'm uh, shaking it so much. So that's why that, so let me, just to make the amplitude super small, you actually don't need, so this is one of the things that you will see on the lab, in the lab. Uh, when you have a resonance condition set up, you don't need a large amount of uh, kind of um, oscillating driver to observe a, 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 a large buildup of oscillation energy. And um, so that's what you are seeing here. Now, over time, you will see this amplitude kind of go down over time. I'm just gonna chalk that up to um, uh, artifact of simulation. Uh, it can also be seen as an illustration of beat, but I'll just leave that there. So, you know, on the left hand here, it's barely moving, but over many cycles, enough energy builds up here that you can see uh, what we call standing wave. Um, I like to say, oh, the standing part of the standing waves are the nodes. They don't move. Uh, their location doesn't move, and they also don't move up and down as much at the nodes. Um, now, there's also Antinodes and antinodes uh, are, uh, let me just wait a little bit after this artifact of simulation goes away. Antinodes also, in some sense, they don't move in the sense of their locations don't move. It's the location where it moves the most, but where that happens, it remains the same for a given frequency and wavelength and all that. Now, uh, you can actually go down a little bit. So let me just change it to half this frequency. So that would be, a uh, let me see here. I always have this rounding issue. Uh, okay, so 0 0.42. I'll write, round it down to that. 0 0.42. So um, it, it, this is the lowest frequency for this setup where you can build up a standing wave. And uh, something like this is what you see as a standing wave. And when you look at the start of your lab manual, this is the example that I'm starting with. So you can see here that the shape, the kind of the pattern you get here, that's exactly what this picture is trying to refer to. So one would be at one point in the cycle of the oscillation, two would be, I think that's quarter of the way, three is the half a cycle over, and then back to two is three quarters of a cycle. And when it comes back to position of one, that's one full cycle. So, and uh, you can, you know, play with this simulation and uh, try to get these other two pictures and uh, <laughs> that'll be fun. And uh, as you are playing with it, what you will see is that if you have a given frequency that works here, the frequency that works here will be double that roughly. Uh, or it should be exactly double because of the rounding issue here. That's the rough part. And the frequency that works here would be the triple of the original fundamental frequency. Now, so that's for that setup. That's for a setup that looks like this. And what's different with your lab setup is that your boundary conditions are different. 
So here, um, I might say my boundary conditions, conditions at the boundary, are that I have nodes at each of the ends. I have no, so even though this is the driving end, because it moves up and down so little, I'm gonna call that my node. And this end here, it's node because it's tied down. And um, it's, but whatever the reason for these points being node, what's important is that the conditions at the boundary is that they are nodes. They are the points of standing waves that don't move, uh, move at all, uh, up and down. Or, or side to side if it's a longitudinal wave. And all the other higher harmonics of standing wave, um, they all still obey this boundary condition. So let me find the frequency where, I don't know, this is 10 times the fundamental. So times 10, oh, four, I could have done that in my day, 4.24. So at the frequency of 4. Point, sorry, I can't go that high. Um, yeah. Divide by 10 again. Um, I don't know. Uh, seven? I, I think times the seven will work. Okay. 2.97. So at the frequency of 2.97, uh, I should be able to get another standing wave. Let's see what that looks like. And uh, yeah, that's kind of a standing wave. Uh, let me just do a slow motion. Um, and and yeah, and both uh, for the fundamental and the seventh harmonic, uh, seventh or sixth, depending on how you count. What stays a constant is the conditions at the boundary. That at the boundary here and here, it's nodes. Uh, what uh, different is well, how many more nodes do you have in between? And so, what's a fundamentally different in your lab setup is this boundary condition. Instead of having nodes at both ends, you'll have node at one of the two ends which end, it depends on which representation you use. And at the other end, you are going to have um, the other thing. <laughs> so if we, at one end you had node, at the other end you will have antinode. If one at one end you had an antinode, then at the other end you will have a node. So within this simulation, this is how I, I can get two different boundary conditions. So uh, the boundary condition of node here, well, it came about because I made, I clamped it down. I made it physically impossible to move. So we can make it uh, most easiest to move. That's the loose end. That's where this is replaced with a, um, a smooth ring so that this is free to move up and down. And basically at this end, it it's got half the inertia. It doesn't have the other bit on the other side that would have weighed it down. So this is the most free spot along the string that it can move. And that makes the condition here on antinode. It's the spot on the string that's most free to move. So it moves the most. So what you will see, if I keep this frequency the same, you will see that um, that you no longer have a standing wave setup, and um, and yeah, you, you don't get any of that. If I go back to the frequency that I started out with, um, you zero point eight four eight four eight five. Uh, when I go back to this frequency, you will see that uh, over time it doesn't build up any kind of uh, shape, and I can even increase the amplitude if I want, and that'll make the shaking larger, but you won't see anything that you recognize as a standing wave pattern. And um, I, I think if you think about this through the lens of um, boundary condition, then you can almost intuitively understand it. Because, um, so I keep saying the boundary condition here is that you have a, uh, that you have an, um, an antinode at the end, that the condition at this end, is antinode. And if you think back to what kind of shape of wave you had with this frequency, then then yeah, of course that doesn't fit because the kind of the waves you saw then looks something like this, something sinusoidal. 
you know, it starts at a node here and it ends at a node here. So if you had a standing wave of this shape, then you would have a node here that's contradicting this. So it can't happen. And the same thing holds for the lower frequency of 0.42. So what, what you really need to do here is um, uh, find a new shape that's going to somehow be able to form the required antinode here. And um, and that's the question that this uh, pre-lab question is trying to walk you through, I think. Uh, yeah, this pre-lab question is trying to have you do, uh, which comes from uh, this description here. So this is the description, and then I'm trying to get you to, well, uh, let's draw some pictures where your sending wave starts out at a node, uh, at one of the ends and ends at an antinode at the other end. And one thing I will tell you while I'm here is that this picture, it does not show you the, um, it, it, it does not show you the standing wave pattern with the, the smallest possible portion of a wave. Because imagine starting from a node here and just stopping whenever you see an antinode as you go from right to left. Now, starting at a node, and the very first antinode that you see is here. Because this point here is, you know, it's here at this point in the cycle. And a later point in the cycle, it's going to move the most here. So that's, there's a, this, uh, this is the smallest portion of a wave that you can fit into a condition where you have a node at one end and the antinode at the other end. So, I recommend that you draw a picture. That's why the lab manual tells you to do that. Because once you draw the picture, then you can kind of see, okay, let's try drawing a, uh, so, you know, something like, let's try drawing a full, one full wavelength. And if you have that, okay, uh, this is half of that one full wavelength. This is a quarter of the wavelength. And that's the kind of thing that once you draw the picture, you can kind of see it a lot more easily than if you're trying to figure it through some formulas. If you get as far as figuring, oh, so the smallest portion of a wave that you can fit in, it went from being half of a cycle, uh, which is what it used to be when I had to end it or not, to being a quarter of a cycle. Then when you work through the relationship between frequency, wavelength, and period, what you should eventually get at is that instead of my uh, lowest frequency uh, standing wave being able to be half of this frequency, it's going to be a quarter of that frequency. So let me take that. Um, uh, let me just reset this so 1 over 1.1. 1 .1. I'm trying to avoid this um, uh, rounding error. So divide that by a 4. Because I, with this new boundary condition, I can fit a quarter of the wave for a standing wave. Okay, so that's 0 0.21. Um, okay, let me go all the way down to 0 0.21. And it's going to take a little bit of time to build up this standing wave. Partly because it's so, uh, you know, it's such a low frequency thing. Yeah, and I am on normal and not on slow motion. And you'll see that over time, this frequency that's designed to, to fit a quarter of the wavelength into that length. It does build a standing wave with the boundary condition that we identified. We do get an antinode here and so on. So, and finding the rest of the frequencies, um, it's working through the same exercise. Really the two things you keep constant is you keep this end at a node, one of the ends is at a node, and you keep this end at an antinode. And so the really the only thing that can change is how many more in between nodes and antinodes do you have? And um, as you look for that next frequency, if as you think through, what you should eventually uh, find is, that, oh, the shape that's illustrated here, that should give us our next frequency. So um, so this is this uh, contains a half of the cycle and then a quarter, so three quarters of a cycle. So it's going to be this frequency times three because you're um so by the way this is one thing that's different between this uh, simulation and your lab in your lab uh, what uh, mainly meant to be changed is the length itself at least for the first part of the lab you'll keep the frequency the same and you'll change the length um 
In this simulation, I don't have a way to change the length, so I'm just going to have to change the frequency. So here, that's why I'm going to be increasing the frequency by a factor of three, so that I can fit three quarters of a wavelength into this same length, uh, 0 0.64. Okay. And when I run that, you will see that um, you'll see that over time it'll build up a standing wave with the same boundary conditions of a node at one end, anti-node at the other end. And what's changing in order to, to make the wavelength shorter is that I have an additional node, additional anti-node. And I can go to um I don't know. Uh, so let me uh just, so if I multiply the original wavelength by four, then I'm going to just get uh, a full wavelength. I don't want that. Um, I want to end that uh, like, uh, how do you call it? Um, half a cycle plus a quarter. So in order to do that, what I'm going to need is uh, uh, basically all the multiples. So, um, so that times I did the five, uh, three before. If I do times five, that should get me another standing wave, 1.06. So uh, 1.06. And I just reset it so that it doesn't do the other thing. So yeah, over time, a standing wave builds. And again, node, anti-node, additional nodes in between. Uh, oh, let us uh, let me try the highest frequency I can get here. So it goes up to three. Uh, and I'm thinking of, in terms of the multiples of 0 0.212. So 15 isn't quite right, right? That goes over. 14 doesn't work because it's an even integer. So 13, let me try 13. So 2.75 hertz should work. Let's give it a try. Um, I don't think I've actually tried this before. So if the calculations are right, this should give me a standing wave. Just, uh, um, I think at some point that high enough harmonics, it becomes uh, harder to see the difference between when you had um, nodes at the both ends versus when you have node and anti-node at uh, the other end. Uh, partly because you can kind of see here, you know, if I had a node at the both ends, then it's equivalent of stopping at this frequency here. So the kind of the difference in the result uh, with the two different boundary conditions, it's more noticeable at the lower frequency, lower harmonic end. Um, but uh, yeah, so this simulation is, uh, it can illustrate that kind of a uh, difference you get depending on the boundary conditions. Here with the uh, loose end, the boundary condition, you get an anti-node. So when you come up with a relationship for the wavelength, and uh, I guess the way usually is you come up with a relationship for wavelength first, then either knowing or assuming speed of the wave, you can calculate the frequency. Um, and when you do that, uh, you have to take into account that it's going to be an anti-node here. So, so that's the uh, kind of the lecture on boundary conditions that's uh, missing. Uh, I mean, in terms of what boundary conditions are, it's kind of simple. <laughs> Condition at the boundary. Is it a node or anti-node? Now, I'm being a little bit simplistic here. Um, as you do uh, differential equation solving, especially in your math 3F and possibly other uh, future physics classes, what you'll find is that there are more varieties of boundary condition. In fact, when you get to quantum mechanics and you do the step potential solution solving, then um, the, then there are uh, more nuanced boundary condition than simply asking, is it a node or anti-node? Uh, but for the purpose of our lab, that is really the key question. At the end, at the boundaries, do you have a node or anti-node? And the way I prefer pressure representation, at the open end, you will have a node. Uh, your textbook uses the displacement representation for this picture, which is why your textbook has an antinode at the open end. Uh, but other than that, somewhat confusing reversal, um, the outcome is the same, because really what matters is that the boundary conditions at the two ends are opposite of each other. It, and as far as the frequency goes, it doesn't matter how are they opposite, as long as they are opposite. So.